to uh, Luke chapter 14. Very familiar scripture there. And when you get to Luke 14, I want to start in uh, verse 25. Verse 25, it says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, these large crowds, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, and his brothers and his sisters. Yes, even his own life. Then he cannot be my disciple. Oh, well, you know, then he goes on to say here in verse 27, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Well, when he said this, he wasn't crucified yet. In our mind, he's crucified. He's Christ crucified, yeah. But then when he said that, he wasn't crucified. He said, take up his cross and follow me. His stake, his staros. Wow. Well, what very strong language. If anyone comes to me, right? And the modern world and modern Christianity say, well, you just got to believe in Jesus in your heart. You just got to accept, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Well, you do. But here's what Jesus said, if you will receive it. Because everyone says, Lord, Lord, but they don't listen to what he said. He said, if anyone comes to me, Jesus, and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, Yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Period. That's pretty startling. They knew, the people that were hearing this, the crowds, they knew what the fifth commandment said. They knew in Exodus 20 that it said that you had to honor your father and your mother. They knew that. And they, Christ knew as well, the impact that his words would have when he spoke them. He knew the impact that they would have. But he was starting to stir something. He was starting to move something with these words. That's why last week when we read this conversation that he had with the Pharisees that believed in him, they believed in him. That conversation that he had, it, the conversation went very sour very quick. But he told them that whatever you obey and whatever that you, 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 you're a slave to, you know, or whatever you obey, you're a slave to it. So he knew the impact that his words would have. And there are scriptures that I'll show you as we move forward in our talk here that he could have used to explain himself, but he didn't. He just said what he said. He said what he said. Christ knew the impact that his words would have in lending, lending to those who were looking to trap him in what he said. Constantly we can read in the Gospels how they were looking to trap him in his words. And they even had experts in the law and, and people come to him and, you know, uh, ingratiate him and say, you know, oh, teacher, master, we know that you're a wise person. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they asked him a kind of a trick question. And they became continually frustrated. So much so to the point where they just never asked him any more questions. So he knew the impact that his words would have in lending to those who were looking to trap him in what he said. We realized that they would not understand, and that's what I was getting to. He said, there is no room for my word in you when he was talking with these Pharisees. Right after he told them that the truth would set them free. And they got, took exception with the fact that he was saying that they were slaves. And then he explained himself and said, well, if you're a sinner, then you're a slave to sin. No one said, well, no, that's wrong because of 
You know, that's very funny to me how the facts never get presented, just hyperbole. Nobody quotes scripture to back up what they say. They just say it. Well, I hope they realize that they have to be responsible for what they say. So Christ said, there's no room for my word in you. And I asked you last week, well, what does that mean? There's no room for my word in you. Well, again, he's making one of these statements. If anyone doesn't hate his father and his mother, his wife, his children, and even his own life is not worthy of me. Wow, what kind of expectation do we need to have in order to be his followers? I'll explain that. I'll explain that. And he could have. But the scriptures explain it. And if you know the scriptures, you will know the answer. Because they'll be calling to your ears. You'll hear it. And you'll hear it today. Please, God. By his will, you'll hear it today. We realize that they would not understand and they, they would go on eventually to accuse and persecute Jesus. Which eventually would lead them to them murdering him. And it did. Like I said last week, in the beginning of that scripture it said those who believed on him. And he told them exactly where their hearts were at. That they wanted to do the will of their father, the devil. They wanted to murder him. And that's where that nature that they were harboring. That's where that vainful pride that they were hanging on to was going to lead eventually to murdering him because they wouldn't accept his words. They had no room for his words in them. But do we fully understand what was planted by our Lord long ago? Do we fully understand what was planted? We can never understand completely until we have brought to a finish the fruit which comes from the seed that was planted in us. And the only way that we can be brought to a finish is by making a decision to live our life hour by hour, like what was, was uh, in the opening prayer. Hour by hour, day by day. By living our lives to its end whatever end that is for us. My mother used to say, the kingdom could come for you next week. That's a common understanding. We don't have any guarantees that we're gonna live past today or this very second. Are we ready, is what she used to say. Are you ready? And that was very valid. And that's never left me from, this, from that day forward. Are you ready? Would be something that would come to confront me over and over again. And of course the answer would be, I'm not ready. Well, you better get ready. Because the kingdom could come for you. So whatever end that is, that is for us, we are led to real life. How? Well, by the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Through a process. There's a process here. Just like there's a process in making, you know, this coffee or making this glass. Making this pen. There's a process in making that. There's a process to this. and There's a process in making you who you are about to become. You know, and it says, and yes, even hating his own life. Right? Even hating his own life. Well, why is that such a challenge? People want to Walk around and think it's, well, yeah, I could give up my life for that. No, you will not. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. And here's how we know why. We back it up with Scripture. This Scripture edifies our mind to our own nature, coming and going. Right? All Scripture is God-breathed, profitable for reproof and for instructing. Well, so let it instruct you. Open your heart first. And then it can instruct your mind. And your, and your heart can be led and molded. Job 2, chapter 2, and verse 3. Of course, Job was tested. We know that. God was holding Job up as an example. In Job chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. Wow. He is blameless 
Now for those people who say, oh well we sin and we fall down and we gotta get back up, and that's true, but we have to have a benchmark, and that benchmark is Jesus Christ. But lined up right behind him is Abraham, is Job, who it says that he was upright, he fears God, and he was blameless and had integrity. So did Elizabeth and Zachariah, the parents of John. They were living a blameless life. Wow. So there are benchmarks. There are uh, people that were living uh, close to the way that we're commanded to. So we can't make excuses for ourselves. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So he didn't just sit there and say nothing. He didn't just say, well, we'll just, you know, I believe in God and I'm going to do what's right and they can do whatever they want. No, he shunned evil. Given the opportunity, when it came before him, he shunned it. His opinion and his pressure was brought to bear. But so should our, ours be. And we will be persecuted for that. John the Baptist was, he was beheaded for it. For telling Herod that he was doing wrong. And he gave his life for that. We know that he was blameless and we know that he shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity. Though you, Satan, enticed me against him to ruin him without any reason. Sorry, incited me, not enticed me. Incited me. Then Satan says to him, and this tells you a lot of the, the modus operandi behind his thinking and who he is. Skin for skin. Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life to save his own neck. You see, he was betting his, he was betting the whole hand on this one. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to your face. Wow. He knows our nature. 99% of the time he would be right. So when Jesus Christ says that you don't even love your own life more than him, and I'll explain how that all works in a bit here, but at least we know what, we are, what is required of us, where we need to be. So not loving your own life begins now with your own choices. Not loving your own life begins with your own discipline that you're imposing on yourself now. And listening to the Spirit when it comes to you and it wants to help you change and overcome certain things. If you don't do that, then you don't, you don't care. You are not laying down your life. Laying down your life can be by your action and your discipline and allowing Him to mold and shape your hearts to the point where you may actually be ask or have to lay down your life and that's fine as well because we're bought at a price our lives are not our own after all they belong to him in Luke you know we sing the song Jesus loves me and he does but he said some things while he was here that I want you to pay attention to and I want to point out to your to your attention Luke chapter 12, and we'll go to verse uh, 49, we'll start there. Oh, it's good. And he says something again, very, very hard, uh, very hard to, uh, uh, to, to understand, very hard to absorb completely. So he says in verse 49, I have come to bring fire on the earth. Okay. And how I wish it were already kindled, already lit. But I have a baptism first to undergo. And how distressed I am until it is completed. So that's the part that he would speak on his own towards those many sorrows that we know that he was a man of. Many sorrows. That's what we're told. And how he is distressed and how he wished that it was completed. So. Think not that I have come to bring peace, but I've come to bring a fire on the earth, right? If you go to Luke 3, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it really quick. Because right away what comes to mind 
is something that John the Baptist said. So in Luke chapter 3 and uh, verse 15, it says, so it gives you, yeah, a narrative as to what was going on. The people were waiting expectantly, and they were all wondering in their hearts. So they, they were really moved. If John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all very clearly. I baptize you with water. But one more powerful than I will come. The tongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to even untie. Wow, was he ever lifting up Christ? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What does that mean? What does that mean? So Christ says with his own words in Luke 12, I have, not come, I have come to bring fire on the earth. Wow. And that ties in also, if the Spirit is likened to this fire, then there's another role that the Spirit does, and it doesn't do so so intentionally. But it divides those that are called of God by their decisions and by their conduct and by what is now leading them away from those that are entrapped in the way of this world. They're entrapped in it. They're engulfed in it the same way that we were. So there is a dividing now and a fire, right? A spirit and a baptism of fire. And that coincides with that he would pour out his spirit. Pour out his spirit in the last days. Well, we're in the last days. That spirit's going to be poured out. That's what it says. And that spirit is a fire. A fire. And we will feel that. And we do, some of us feel it today. So that's what John the Baptist said. He will baptize you with the spirit and with fire. Do you think that I came to bring peace on the earth? Verse 51, Luke 12. No. Wow. Is that ever a shocker? Modern Christianity believes, oh, you know, that he did. Well, Jesus Christ is saying with his own words, no, I have not. No, I tell you, but division is what he's brought. From now on, there will be five in one family, divided against each other. Imagine that. That's what it says. Three against two, and two will be against three. They will be divided again, he reiterates. Father against son, and he gives you the dy dynamic. Son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. And daughter-in-law against, uh, sorry, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. What could this be? What could this mean? This is very striking. This is very alarming. You should find this very alarming. If that's the condition, then what hope do we have? Why is that so? Why is our Lord saying this? Why? What purpose does it serve? And this comes now to the point where there are scriptures that he could have used to explain himself, but he didn't. And I'm going to use those same scriptures today. Hopefully he'll guide me through this and I'll be able to do this for you. But it's in the Bible. We'll go to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33. And we'll start in verse 8. This just starts to get your mind moving towards where I want to go with this. So Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 8. About Levi, this is when Moses was blessing the tribes. And he gets to Levi. And here's what he says about Levi in chapter 33 verse 8. About Levi, he said, Moses said, Your Tumanan and your Urim belong to the man you favored. Right? So your Tumanan and your Urim now there's been a lot of talk about these two elements. And really you shouldn't give a care. 
Because the most potent thing that could be long is, is commanded by God just as much as the Thuminim and the Urim. And I believe that there's a tie in to it. But I'm not even going to speculate. There's been so much talk over nothing. The Holy Spirit is what is given. To know and discern while your mind is renewed by that Spirit what God's will is. Your Thuminim and your Urim belonged to the man that you favored. So this was something that God could bestow on one who was walking with him and that he favored. You tested at Massah. You contended with him at the waters of Mirabah. He said of his father and mother, I have no regard for them. Wow. He did not recognize his brothers or acknowledge his own children, Levi. But he watched over your word and he guarded your covenant. He teaches your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. Wow. Wow. Verse 9, he said of his father and mother, I have no regard for them. He did not recognize his brothers or acknowledge his own children, but he watched over your word. He guarded your covenant, and he teaches your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. This is the beginning of it, that that word and that this spirit and this responsibility to preserve and obey and to enact separates between those which are his and those which are not his, but somebody else's. And that's what Christ said very plainly. You have no room for my words in you. And then he spoke about their nature coming from their father, the devil, who was a murderer from the beginning. He spoke about the murderous intentions that they were harboring in their heart, at least the seeds of which would come out later when they went to seize him and falsely accuse him and then take his life. But imagine that, Levi in the pursuit of his duty, had no regard for those things that otherwise would pull at any man's heart. But once they came up as a comparison to what their duty was to deliver to the people before their God, there was no comparison. And now we start to get into, understand what Christ was trying to communicate. If you love mother and father no more than me, son or daughter, husband or wife, then you're not worthy of now we're starting to get into the mindset of exactly what this is. And where Christ was going. And Christ could have used this scripture to illustrate exactly what he meant. It's right in Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. If you go to Deuteronomy uh, 13, before this, while we're here in the book, there's something of, it, of equivalent standing regarding this disconnect to normal and traditional relations that would pull to the deepest part of our heart and that we would think are inseverable. Watch. Deuteronomy uh, 13 and verse 6. It says, If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your fathers have known, right? Now God is fully aware of that, of that conflict in our heart. That's why he's creating that contrast, right? Even the wife you love, he's saying, or the closest friend, secretly entices you, right? That secretly enticing is from a different place and it serves a different purpose. And they say secretly to you to entice you to go and worship gods that neither you nor your fathers have known. Gods of the peoples around you, right? And we could, we could supplant and put anything in its place. 
with the distractions that we have today, money, sex, prestige, right? Fame, feeding of vanity, whatever it is. Anything but God. And that your fathers have not known, verse 7, gods of the peoples around you, whether near or far, from one end of the land to the other. Right? Do not yield to him, to them, or listen to them. And now we're getting into the meat and potatoes. Show him no pity. Do not spare him or shield him. Why? Why? Because what has now taken a hold of them to secretly and in a in clandestine way try to entice you. Those are the words that are used here, secretly, entice. These are methods that are from the devil. That's what he did. Because of what has take, now taken a hold of them, inside of them, and that it is so complete, whatever has taken a hold of them, that it has begun to overflow and to influence others. This has happened in the spiritual realm long ago. And it still is happening on this earth today. This is the modus operandi of the devil. To secretly and operate, whispering in an inclandestine way to bring his influence to bear. Do not spare him or shield him. You must certainly, in verse 9, put him to death. And don't forget, it said, even the wife that you love, God is very aware of the contrast. He's very aware of where your heart is at as a human being. Your hand must be the first in putting him to death. Why? Why? Because you, knowing them better than anyone else, and you having an emotional investment with them, should be the first in not serving your feelings to have the collective become polluted by inaction. And we do this all the time. Just because you love, just because you feel, doesn't mean the world's going to stop. And that's for me. You, anybody. Just because you have feelings doesn't mean that it makes it right. And we cannot serve our feelings or ourself above the collective. This body of, of, of Christ, this family of God, we must serve one another. And in serving one another, we must relinquish what we harbor selfishly in our heart, even at what we might consider to be the highest and most pure form of our ability to express, which is our love. And that's what's being used in this world today. Well, it's just love. It's just two people that want to love each other. That's wrong. And that's what God is saying. That's what Christ is saying. Just because you have feelings, doesn't mean that they should come in the way of you being able to bond yourself to a body of believers. This is your family. When they were waiting for him, and his family seemed to be waiting for him for an extended time. And just like his brother said, you know, if you want to be a rock star, why don't you go to the feast? Nobody that wants to be a star operates, you know, out of the public eye the way you do. Well, he was communicating with the crowd and he was doing his father's work. And his family were waiting and the people were like going along the human lines. Well, you know, Jesus's, Jesus's family is waiting for him. So someone came and said, you know, your mother and brothers, they've wait, been waiting for you for a while. And he chose at that moment to take that and not serve himself at all, but to serve those people like he did 
if you do the will of my Father which is in heaven, then you are my mother. Imagine how that landed on their ears. You are my mother and you are my brothers. He was telling them that this ultimately is where we're going to exist and reside. We're going to be family like never before, an eternal family, not a temporal family, not a temporal husband or wife, not a temporal relationship between a child and a parent. And that is God ordained, and God set that up, and I understand that. But it does not supersede this. It's not as important as this. Because it's forever. You're going to soon realize that we're slaves either way. We're slaves either way. Because we're born, and death governs us. We're temporal and fleshy physical beings that can be swayed and pushed about in the spirit world. And in the winds of that world, pushed back and forth between good and evil. We're slaves anyway. <laughs> it just depends on whose master you choose. I'll back that up with scripture. Don't believe me. The reason why that you had to have to have a hand in putting them to death was because you were knowing them better than anyone else. You were able to see firsthand because you had that emotional investment with them. And you were the first one that had to relinquish your personal feelings for the greater good of the nation, Israel. We serve our feelings way too much today. And we are unwilling to discipline ourselves. We are unwilling to sacrifice for the greater good because we love, we feel, so then the whole world's gotta stop. No, it doesn't. Some things are greater than us. Think of the methods that Satan used to pollute one third of the angels in heaven. And the consequences to them and to the world. Don't forget what we read in Revelation 12, verse 4. That he swept a third of the stars out of heaven and cast them to the earth. And then it's saying here, And then the hands of all the people after you initiate the first strike. Stone him to death. Why? Because he tried to turn you away from the Lord your God. In other words, there are things that work for the greater good. There are things that work for eternity. Not just for the here and now. Not just for the I love you moment. Because 20 and 30 and 40 years pass by like the snap of a finger. And next to the eternity that is now standing and being offered in front of us, they have no comparison being given a small, small view of the big picture. He tried to get you away from the Lord your God who is life, who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And then all of Israel will hear of what happened and they will be afraid because you've defied your nature and you have denied your heart. You've denied your love for the greater good for the nation and to put away and to put down what could be polluting to your family. Even if you don't succumb, you have a social responsibility now, now that you've become aware, to put it down. Then all Israel will hear it, be afraid, and no one among you will do such an evil thing again. That was a method. Shocking as it was. In John chapter 8, the Gospel of John. This sermon is entitled, like it was last week, United We Stand. And you could be thinking, well, where's the United We Stand part? Well, we can't stand united without basic, a basic fundamentals a basic understanding of what puts a foundation under who we are 
an understanding of what's required of us, of where we sit. Jesus Christ tried to convey that. We read his words. No one who wants to follow me and loves, puts his mother and his father, his son or his daughter, his wife or anyone, even his own life ahead of this purpose, is not worth it. And if they don't pick up their staros, their stake, their cross, and follow me, and be prepared to, to suffer while they're in this world, like I did, they're not worthy of me. Don't bother. And when you read forward in that, he goes on to absolutely, uh, some of these parables ask you to count the cost. He even, he even compares it to building a house, going off to war, whatever. He's trying to ram it home to you, to get you to understand that you need to, you need to sit down and you need to think about this. This is serious. You need to figure it out. We're figuring it out right now. Why he said that? We see it in the Old Testament. He didn't just invent this. This was his words from long ago. John chapter 8, and in verse, uh, uh, again, we go right back to where we were at. Uh, at verse 34, he says, Jesus replied to them, when they said that we're not slaves, we've never been slaves. Well, you were in Egypt. But Christ is calling them, uh, telling them they'll be set free because they're slaves uh, in a different way. Jesus replied in verse 34, I tell you the truth. Everyone, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Period. It's an equation. It's not hard. It's a fact, and it's not a respecter of persons. If you do that, then that's what your condition is. You're a slave. Remember how he was led out to the desert, Jesus, to be tempted. The same wilderness where he led them years ago. The same desert where they fell. Now, he has led us by his example and his sacrifice. That's how he's leading us now. By his flesh and his blood and his Holy Spirit. That's how he's leading us. That's how he's leading us. But we can't have anything stand in the way of that. Nothing that we wouldn't be able to relinquish. Because our hearts, because we love, we cannot serve them. We have to serve Him. We have to serve the greater good. And some of us knows what that means and what that feels like. That's not good. But it is definitely necessary. It's definitely necessary. All things will be reconciled. All things will be brought into order again. And there is nothing hidden that will not be made known. Micah, chapter 7, again something very profound here. Micah is what they call just after Obadiah. It's in around Obadiah, Amos, Haggai, Zechariah. They call them these, the minor prophets, Micah. And uh, in chapter 7, we'll begin at verse 1. What misery is mine? I am like one who gathers summer fruit. In chapter 7, verse 1. At the gleaning of the vineyard, there is no cluster of grapes even to eat. None of the early figs that I crave. The godly have been swept from the land. Okay. No, not one upright man remains. Remember what we talked about weeks and weeks ago? About he looks for a man to stand between him and the people. He looks for a man to stand between him and the land. And there was a point where he found none. Well, this speaks to that time. All men lie in wait to shed blood. Each hunts his brother with a net. Wow. Both hands are skilled at doing evil. Ambidextrous evil doing. 
The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. Sounds a lot like today's world. The best of them is like a briar or a thorn bush. The most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. Wow. The day of your watchman has come. The day God visits you. Wow. Now is the time of their confusion. What does that mean? Now is the time of their confusion. Now there's a time here. And we can read in Ecclesiastes, and we're going to, that there is a season and a time for all things. Now is the time for their confusion, or of their confusion. Do not trust a neighbor. Uh-oh. Put no confidence in a friend. And I've often said that people lack the emotional maturity today and the selflessness to be a friend. And for many years, people would be able to say, and rightly so, that if you could count on one hand how many friends you've had while you've walked through this life, you'll be doing well. Why do they have sayings like that? And why has that been possible to say that for so long? Do not put trust in a neighbor. Put no confidence in any friend. Even with her who lies in your embrace. Oh my. Be careful of your words. Do not be confident, uh, have no confidence in any friend, even with her who lies in your embrace. I'm going to turn real quick here to Matthew 24. Just quick, you don't have to turn there, I'll, I'll just read it while we're on that part of the scripture. Matthew 24 and verse 12. And it says, right, really quick here. Actually, we'll go to verse 10. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. At that time. Again, we're dealing with an appointed time. We just talked about a time of their confusion. Now is the time of their confusion. Right? Now is the time for the watchman to come. Now is the time for their God to come and visit them. Wow. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. And they will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets at that time will appear and deceive many people. That's why I continually say, as do teachers that have gone before me, don't believe me, believe your Bible. And that is part in, uh, of our faith. And is a part of the banner that we carry, that we need to prove all things like the Bible instructs. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because, in verse 12, of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Because of the increase of wickedness, people will fall away from the faith, substantially so, because it's being recorded here by Jesus Christ in his own words. So that has to be quite substantial. Whatever's happening here, people falling away from the faith, people betraying and hating each other, Whatever's happening here is, is quite substantial. That's why Christ is bringing it up. Because it has tremendous significance. It's not a thing of small things for him to say something like that. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is the scripture I've read many times over the last so many months. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it real, really quickly here. Beginning in verse 1 it says... But mark this, remember this, and take a special note of this. This is significant. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And the very first part of a list that he gives, a litany of things that would be extant to these people, is people will be lovers of themselves. And that would indicate that they love themselves completely, and holy themselves. There's no room for anybody else. The love of many will grow cold. 
So there is no relationships without love. And those relationships, when they're tested, and love is tested continually, all the time, it's revealed for what it is. That's why it's saying here, even her who lies in your embrace, when this condition is prevalent on the earth, even the most sacred places and the most, what we would understand as a society in all of our history, the most kindled portion of our love will still be suspect. Wow. What kind of condition is that? What kind of world is that? One that I don't want to really be involved with anymore. I don't. Even with her who lies in your embrace, in your embrace be careful of, of your words. Now that one I got to really look into. I don't know if I really understand all of what that means. I'm not going to pretend to either. But it's instructing us to be careful of your words. Okay. For a son dishonors his father. Here we go. A daughter rises up against her mother. This is a condition. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. How could they do that? And the people that are reading this are going, how could this be? What kind of world is that going to be? It's going to be a world where everyone loves themselves. When they're lovers of themselves. It's going to be a world where we allow it to go evil and we don't shun evil like Job did. And we allow evil to flourish unchallenged. We allow evil to flourish unchallenged. We don't confront the people and show them their sins. We don't even show them a good example. A daughter rises up against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Shame. A man's enemies are the members of his own household. And this was said in Micah long before Christ ever came along. And Jesus Christ could have used these scriptures. He could have used them. He didn't. We're reading them today. And this is where he got his teaching from. Because he was talking directly about the condition that would be extant, not only at the end times, but the condition that would be extant between the dividing of those which were his own, that he was liberating, that were going to be traveling now as strangers in the world, and those that would be in the world. And the world would love its own, but the world would hate those that would now be following him. And this would divide us along traditional lines. Don't forget the parable of the weeds. Those weeds were growing right beside the wheat. So much so that when the servant who could recognize where the weeds were asked if he would go and pull them out because they were choking the wheat, he was cautioned by the master to not do so because if they plucked them out before it was harvest time, that it would also pull the wheat up as well. That's how intertwined they were. And that also serves another purpose, to test the hearts of those who are called by the Almighty and to help them grow and to test them. And it's hard. It's not easy. Because now you're dealing with your love and you're dealing with your heart. And it's going to get pulled at. And we're going to be thrown at one another and rammed into one another. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood even though there's a human being standing in front of you. It's tough. It's tough. I mean, he finishes here in chapter 7 and verse 7, But as for me, and as for you, I watch in hope for the Lord. And he's shocked. He's, he's shell-shocked shocked and he's stunned. I wait for God, my Savior, to save him from what he's looking at, from saving, saving him, from this world, what he now has a clear view of. That's why he's saying Savior. I wait for God, my Savior, my God will hear me. Hear him what? Plead. Hear him pray and help him. His Savior will save him. Our Savior will save us. And if you look at that, what it says here, about even her who lies in your embrace. Again, we could go to Job real quick here. And we could see a physical, uh, I don't know, an example of that, I suppose. I'll turn there if you want real quick. Job chapter 2. 
Job chapter 2 and verse 9. And it says in verse 9, Job's wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. That's what his wife said. She lived with Job. She had a family with Job. She raised that family. She knew what kind of man her husband was. I dare say that she wasn't a bad person herself. But now that they lost their kids and they lost their home and they lost everything, just like Satan said, you take away these things, he'll curse you to your face. Well, he didn't, but she sure did. Why are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And now here's Job's reply to her. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Wow. Oh, even this one that shared his bed, like we've just read here, even with her who lies in your embrace, even at the height of what you can experience in the love of your heart, could still be undermined, could still be used against you. Look at Lot's wife. She turned back. She looked at the world that was left behind. And instead of being sickened by it, she looked back longingly and she was told not to. And she was turned into a pillar of salt for it. She looked back. Psalm. This is very beautiful. Go to Psalm 73. Again, this is speaking in a similar way to what Christ was speaking to. Psalm 73, verse 21. It says, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Wow. Some of us can relate with that. And yet, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand, like a child. You guide me with your counsel, your word, your spirit. And afterward, you will take me into glory. David knew what was waiting for him after he died. Whom I have, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing that I desire besides you. Whom do I have in heaven but you? And earth has nothing that I desire besides you. In other words, there is not wife, son, daughter, brother, sister getting in the way. Earth has nothing that I desire besides you. Because if God has his way, we're all going to be dwelling as an eternal family anyway. We're going to be connected in, in, in a very intimate way. Much more than we are on this level as physical beings. He has a plan. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and in verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said if anyone would come after me he must deny himself, and he must take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Well, remember what I said when he said he must take up his cross and follow me. This was before he died. This statement from Christ was given well before his death. 
laying down words and precepts that would have fulfillment in the future. Once he said this, and they recorded this in their memory, later in their writing, and he was crucified, then they understood it. Then it meant so much more. The scriptures were open. What he said was open to them. Now that they had the spirit. Some things that are lying there are served at a proper time. When it's time for them to be served. And the time for certain things to be served for Christian unity amongst brothers is dawning. Because we're far from ready. And that preparation has to start. And it can't start while people are lording it over one another. It can't start while people who call themselves leaders and ministers are beating up the sheep and controlling them and corralling them. This isn't about control. Christ wasn't about control. He was about loving your brother. He was about loving, having them love each other the way he loved them and having them serve one another. Then he says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. God said, in the day that you touch it, this tree, meaning in the day that you sin, you will surely die. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. In the day that you disobey me, you will surely die. If our hope is only in what we could clearly see as fleeting, we could clearly see that our lives are fleeting. My daughter and I were looking at my, uh, my wife and I, uh, our wedding album last night. And we were looking at how many years had passed. And our lives are fleeting. We know how quick the years have passed. So what are we living for? You could drop dead a week from now. Today, exactly. What, what are we living for? What is our hope? There is no hope. Only this. If our hope, our only hope, is in what we can clearly see is fleeting, and our memories tell us how fleeting our life is, then what is the sum of that hope? Where is it leading? What does it mean? What is the sum of that hope which has an end? and cannot go any further when you're dead. And he goes on to say, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for man to gain the whole world? Now listen to this part. What good is it for man to gain the whole world and yet he forfeit his soul, his life? It's like winning the lottery and then you have a heart attack when you found out that you won. You won a ton of stuff. You're never going to enjoy it. What good is it if you have the whole world? Never mind a lottery. The whole world, like Satan offered to him, to Jesus. I will give you all these kingdoms if you would but bow down and worship me. They were his to give. What good is it if you have all of that? And then you die. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I'm getting closer and closer. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Verse 17. So I hated life, Solomon says, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And that's what Christ was saying. What good is it if you should inherit or have the whole world? But then lose your soul, lose your life. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things that I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to 
the one who comes after me. I won't be able to enjoy them. And that's why Christ said, store up your treasures where the moth and rust and decay cannot take hold or destroy. Don't do it here because you're going to be dead. I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. It doesn't matter. He's going to get his stuff. And yet he will have control over all of the work into which I have poured my effort and my skill under the sun. He built it up. It was his. But his son Rehoboam took it over and he was a fool. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all that he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all of the toil and anxious striving for which he labors under the sun? What do we get? All his days his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. <laughs> Even at night his mind does not rest because of his problems. And that's why Christ said, the cares of this world, the cares of this world, right? they eat up what could have otherwise been planted. A man could do nothing better than to eat, drink, and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. That's all. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? God is our joy. And that's why Christ turned to them and said, that we read last week, right? My joy. And now my hope is that my joy will be, that will be your joy, and your joy will be complete in you. To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to one who pleases God anyway. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And we see this with Laban and Jacob. Where Jake, uh, Laban's wealth was given to Jacob right before his eyes. So much so that Laban's sons recognized that their own inheritance was being drawn away and siphoned over to Jacob. Quite honestly. Just by the hand of God. Genesis 3.17. We're going to be closing here right away. Genesis 3.17, it says, To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife, and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, that you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground before you. Through painful toil you will eat of it. All the days of your life. Right? It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are. That's all you are. And we read that last week when Abraham was talking with the Almighty and pleading for righteous people that he thought was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, if I be so bold, now that I've been so bold to open my mouth to you, even though I am nothing but dust and ashes, he knew what he was. Do we know what we are? For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now closing here, I want to go to Romans 6 really quick. One last scripture. Romans chapter 6. Verse 16. It says here, don't you know 
that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as, as slaves, that you are slaves to the one to whom you obey. You're a slave. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or you're a slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness and life. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching, the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. There's a lot said here in a few sentences. You wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. That's huge. You have been set free from sin. Remember what Christ said to those Pharisees that believed on it. That the truth will set you free. That if the son who belongs to the family forever, because a slave never will, if he sets you free, then indeed you are free. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Remember what I said that we're slaves either to either master as we walk through this world. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness. Remember what we read last week about him calling the wretched of this world, the weak of this world, the despised things of this world. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness with disciplining yourselves, being living sacrifices, preparing that you may have to pour out your life either by action in discipline and in teaching and in an example or by martyrdom to pour out your life like a drink offering. When you were slaves to sin, in verse 20, you were, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Huh. Those things result in death. He who, thinks, he who wants to save his life or seeks to save his own life will surely lose it. There's no exit. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, yeah, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, not that you would have it in you. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Either way, we've been born into this world, but for a short time, only to know trouble in that short time. We've been cast in a spiritual wilderness in servitude to either one master or another. The difference is that one master offers not only freedom, but an inheritance as children. He offers eternity and joy and bliss, being part of something that is much bigger than we, other, we otherwise would have ever realized on our own. And we see that happening right now, even though we're human, once we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We see it, a, a, a discipline coming over us. We see a change in our hearts. We see a change in our knowledge. We see a change in our disposition and in our relationships. Don't forget what we were reading months ago about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. That these men, when they stood in front of people, it was very identifiable that they had the Spirit of God. Christ called for us to be lights. Christ called for us to be an example. And that's what we need to be. We need to serve the right master. Thank you.